My problem was I loved getting annihilated, right? Hammered. I went through really dark times when stuff happened to mm. me. You know, when my when when I got cancelled and my father died, and I was I was heavily into addiction and stuff like that, and I really fucking hit a rock bottom. It hurt me, it upset me, and um, I was angry, being suicidal and drinking and the drug use. And initially, the cancelling when I pulled myself out of it, I managed to change my attitude to really enjoying the adversity. Really, I like I loved the doors closing. I loved people saying no. I loved I loved it because I turned it into like a motivation, and also I love my. Stories. Welcome Daniel O'Reilly, also known as Dapper Laughs, to the Turning Your Adversity into an Asset podcast. Great to have you down. Thanks for having me, mate. No worries. So look, I want to give you a, an introduction because I think there's more than meets the eye uh, to Daniel O'Reilly or Dapper Laughs, mm -hmm. um, which we're obviously going to go into. Um, I've got my notes here because, you know, as with every guest, there's, you know, there's what you know of somebody and yeah. then there's what goes on behind the scenes. Yeah, yeah. You know? And when I was reading the notes, based on information that was provided, I was like, I knew like 10% of this, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna share a little bit of an overview of some of the things that you've been up to. Um, and then we'll dive deeper into the story and some of the things um, that have led you on your journey to where you are today and yeah. why you're a great guest for this podcast specifically. Um, cause I should imagine, I don't know how many podcasts you do, but I bet a lot of them just want to talk about, you know, the banter and yeah. the comedy and the stuff like that. Do you, yeah. do you do ones where you dive deep into? Yeah, I've done a few. I mean, I've done like the James English one and a couple of other ones, but I, I, you know, I, yeah, I try and do ones that are a little bit more positive. A lot of people just tend to want to talk about some of the negative stuff that's happened in the back in the past, but yeah. yeah, I'm known for being crazy, <laughs> crazy comedian. So yeah. Yeah. Well, let's, let's dive into that. So <clears throat> we've got a bio here. Daniel O'Reilly is one of the UK's largest influencers, a comedian, actor, musician, didn't know that, viral video star and social influencer with a portfolio of businesses. Um, father, two beautiful girls, love spending time with them. Mm. Um, sold out the O2 stand-up show, mm. released his British movie, The Last Heist, and currently preparing for an upcoming release of other films, Mr. Kiss, and his Daniel was working on a slate of films under his production company, mm. um, which you've just finished writing. And that's actually before we even go into all the backstory, which I'm looking forward to. So there's lots going on. So I didn't know you, you yeah. was a producer and creating yeah. films and stuff like that. Is that is that stuff you openly talk about a lot or? Uh, yeah, I mean, if you follow my, if you follow my like, like my core following, like I, I have like uh, my Instagram and stuff like that and I take them on a bit of a journey um, but the press doesn't, the press don't seem to pick up on. They like the negative. Things, they only they? like the negative stuff. So they don't, pick, you know, they don't, I've sort of, I try and keep, look, I, my positive stuff is, is for my core, my core audience. Like I say, the press don't really pick up on all that stuff. But, um, and I've been working behind the scenes, like quietly at a lot of stuff. It takes a long time to, to get films off the ground, to create scripts and stuff like that. So, you know, a lot of the stuff that's all coming into fruition now, like, you know, I've got a big, um, I've got a film that's just come out. I've got two more that are in post-production um, and a really big one that, that I've written uh, sort of around my journey and struggles and stuff like that. And well, it's got all that information in it. Uh, and yeah, it's they take years. So the mm. film stuff's like five years of hard graft and they're all starting to come out now. So it will feel like I'm... I'm just starting to do films, but it's and it's the same with the tour. I've got a massive stand-up comedy tour um, in January, which is 30 dates around the UK. But that's that's taken 10 years to get back from when I got cancelled. The last mm. time I toured was 10 years ago, so wow. I've had to put on my own shows. You know, I've done the O2, uh, the, the Indigo at the O2, and then I've done the Troxy, and that's where I had to put my money up to rent these venues. You know, 15, 20 grand to rent the venues, and then sell the tickets and make you know write the show and do everything from everything myself from its staff in it the, the merchandise everything and it's taken 10 years to get back to a point where you know promoters or the industry will take will, will take me back on and, and send me out so uh, yeah it will all f to, to people that haven't been following it it seems like well, it's, it's great it's news if you get cancelled you can recover so, yeah of course, <laughs> so everybody of course. who's out there that's like oh i'm worried about what yeah. i might say well as long as you've got 10 years ahead of you you'll be all right <laughs> but you still made it work because that's yeah. the thing you know you there's a lot of people that are like, well, cancelled, I've got no opportunity, so I'm yeah. going to give up. But you said, well, okay, well, I'll just do it all myself then. Yeah. I'll continue creating those opportunities. I might not be 
given a helping hand by certain people. Yeah. Um, but actually, I guess there was a lot of satisfaction. I mean, I'm assuming there was a lot of satisfaction in being able to put on your own yeah. events and create the, your own crew and yeah. become, you know, a business. Mm. You know, that's obviously a, a bit business uh, mm. businessman style way of, of thinking, you know, rather than being you know hired for something you create yeah. your own stage you know yeah i mean like that's why i like this podcast that's why i wanted to come on um you know when you got in contact my pa said to me about the name of the podcast overcoming the adversity because i thrive on i mean i went through really dark times when stuff happened to mm. me you know when my when when i got cancelled and my father died and i was i was heavily into addiction and stuff like that and i really fucking hit a rock bottom and when i started pulling myself out of it. I mean, it was took many, many years, but initially the cancelling, when I pulled myself out of it, I managed to change my attitude to really enjoying the adversity. Really, I, lo I loved the doors closing. I loved people saying no. Mm. I loved I loved it because I turned it into like a motivation. And also I love my story. So, you know, with my following, I'd be like, look at what they're doing to us. Look at what they're trying to stop us doing. Do you know what I mean? And, and it created this mm. following that were like, yeah, fuck the industry, yeah, you yeah. know, fuck the man. And, and then when I put these shows on, I was like, look, I'm going to do it and I'm, I'm going to do this I'm going to do that and they were there and they showed up and um, it's like kind of like being the poster boy for the underdog do you know what I mean and, yeah. and, I, and I still get it now I still I still get it now I still get you know I'm doing comedy gigs now I'm out working my material for the tour and I still get comedians you know trying to you know, say that they're not performing to get a bit of press because they don't want to work with me and I get some comedy clubs won't have me and all this. And I fucking love it. I'm like, you cool. It's always going to come. Yeah, but game, I love it. I'm like, yeah, that's me. Like, do you yeah. know what I mean? That just motivates me. And and, and through, through my time of not being able to work in the public eye, not being able to do comedy and stuff, that's where I, that's when behind closed doors I created all my businesses. Mm. You know, I used my social media following to, um, to create you know, different brands, different businesses within that because I couldn't go out and perform more because I couldn't, mm. you know, I wasn't getting on TV or films yeah. or nothing. Well, you're definitely already so showing signs of turning that adversity into an asset, but we haven't even dived into the story. So, yeah. I mean, for anybody, I mean, a lot of people in the UK will definitely know of you, you know, got nearly a million followers. And back in the day, I can remember, you know, the original videos that were <laughs> the coming vines, out, yeah. the vines, yeah. yeah. And I was one of the ones that were following you right from the very, very start. Um, I think a lot of people in the UK, yeah. but you know, internationally maybe not. So let's, yeah. let's let's talk about that story right from the beginning. So let's start right back to the the, the, the yeah. first couple of videos you shot. Was it was it like just a bit of banter? You know. Well, no. I mean, I was I was I was. Um I was a comedian first and foremost. So back in the day, like when I was 17, 16, 17, I was doing comedy clubs and I wanted to be a comedian. I ended up, um, you know, I wanted to be an actor originally. I went up, you know, done performing arts and, and you know, uh, musical theatre and all that. And when I weren't getting auditions and stuff and I had to get a proper job, um, I was doing comedy. I got into comedy because I could perform. So I was doing the comedy. Um, and then um, my parents, my mum actually moved away to Cornwall when I was 15. So I actually moved out just before my 16th birthday. I was really young, but I was working as well. The same, I was working at a go kart track. So I kind of, I kind of like got into work really early. Do you know what I mean? So I was working and trying to do the comedy, and then it wasn't working out for me. So I just went to work and I become a salesman. And then I was working as an estate agent. I was like a car salesman. Then I was an estate agent. I was great at doing sales. And then I just got some like I think I was 18, and I was like I'm losing my dream, do you know what I mean? Even though I was really young, I kind of looked ahead and thought, this is gonna be me. So I fucked off to Cyprus and I was working in the hotels doing entertainment, you know, calling the bingo, doing who wants to be a millionaire and all of that. Stuff. Napa or? Yeah, yeah, it was Napa, yeah. Oh, I worked in yeah, Napa. Yeah, so so I, was <laughs> I was partying as well up the strip. I can imagine, As yeah. you can imagine, yeah. yeah. Um, and um, and then I started doing stand-up comedy there and I got spotted and then I'd done the cruise ships for fucking years, for about four or five years, I was traveling around the world flying on and off cruise ships and so I saw the whole world in the space of like five years I think it was done some world cruises and I really learned the craft of stand-up comedy and then just as I come back I uh, invested all the money I'd saved in, uh, into starting my own estate agency nice. so I, I started my own estate agency when I was about 26 27 and then I, social media really kicked off and and and, mm -hmm. and I couldn't get out of the office to do the, the stand-up comedy gigs, but discovered Vine and all the jokes that I was writing, because mm. I was still writing, I put them into the six-second comedy things. And then when that blew up, I just sold my offer the business to my business partner and mm. said, like, that's it. Because I remember all, all your videos, you was... In an office. 
We're all yeah. wearing a suit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so office, obviously yeah. it was the And it was a conflict of interest, really, because I was I was dealing with landlords that had multiple properties and everything like that. But then these videos were circulating to me talking about shagging birds and yeah. everything. <laughs> so um, I think it was new and refreshing for a lot of people yeah. to hear that style of comedy at the time, wasn't yeah. it? Just like, fucking hell, he's, he's going that far. But yeah. people like to hear that stuff, don't they? Yeah, I mean, it was... At it, the time, anyway. Yeah, I was really struggling with my comedy when I got back off the cruise ships because I was I tried to do the comedy clubs. And where I've been doing the comedy, the cruise ships, it's family friendly because it's like you've got your mum, your grandma and your kids mm. in the audience. So my comedy was real like family friendly stuff. So when I come back to do the comedy clubs, I was dying on my ass because I was doing all this like, this like family, like wet comedy, do you yeah, know what yeah. I mean? And they people going to the comedy clubs. So I really pushed it. I thought, right, I need to create like a different version of me, an alter ego. And that's where Dapper Last come from. It was like an exaggerated version of me when I was maybe 15, 16, whatever, like ultimate lad culture. Mm. And I just thought, I'd see how far I could fucking push that. And it was great, you know. Majority of people could see that it was satire and that it was, it was like an exaggerated version of lad culture. And, and, the, and, and Dapper Last always failed in the video. Do you know what I mean? He was a twat. He, yeah, was, yeah. he was like, you know, whatever he said didn't work and stuff like that. And it blew up and, and um, yeah, I got, I got to a million. I, f I remember when I got to a million followers on Facebook, the only other sort of Facebook pages that had a million were like Disney, Sony, all the Facebook well, pages. I was going to say, because I remember I was speaking to my wife last night about you because she's from Miami, so yeah. she, she didn't actually uh, know. But I was like, this was probably not far off 10 years ago. Yeah, tw 2014, yeah. And uh, this was when you don't get a million followers no. and you don't get millions of views like nowadays you you know you post yeah. anything and you, yeah. you can get well, well I can't but yeah. <laughs> some people can get millions yeah. of views on a random piece of shit you know as long as it's got some sort of like viral nature of it but back then it's like you got a, yeah no one else was doing it there wasn't anyone doing it so I didn't before, like the yeah Aaron I didn't well. I Aaron didn't Cra I didn't Craskell, yeah his well, well, he, Aaron Craskell was a fan Aaron yeah, Craskell. he came a few few years maybe after. Or yeah, Aaron after. Craskell was a fan of mine, and he, he, uh, I actually spoke. He, he kept contacting me, Aaron Craskell, and I man, and he, I got he, he sent me his number, said he wanted to speak to me, and I rang him one day, and he was working in a betting shop, and he was starting to do videos. Mm. So you know, I inspired a whole fucking hundred percent. I mean, there's many many content creators out there because I do loads of different jokes, and I get bored of a style of doing a, a certain comedy. I create new characters. I've got many, many different characters. Kid Frankie, you know, the, the, the game of geek. I've got all that, like Jim and Steve, loads of different things. I get bored quite easily. Mm. I don't know if it's my ADHD. But other comedians have ran with, with that style of comedy and created whole careers out of them. So I've, I'm quite... I love it when people say like, oh, he's the OG, but it escalated so quickly. And then I got a TV show, you know, I, I blew yeah, up I on Snapchat, blew up on, blew up on Facebook. I think I got to like 3 million on Facebook and then I started, Instagram started and I blew up on Instagram, Snapchat started. I still got one of the biggest Snapchat, I hardly use it, but got a few million on Snapchat and, and then TV come. Well, just quickly at that point then, so you become famous, right? Over, what was that period of time of where it really kind of went viral? And you... Like a year, two years, yeah. Okay, so over that time, what was it like to become famous? And it was quality, it was brilliant. And it was wicked. It must it was... have been difficult as well in terms of uh, at, at lifestyle, be... because I mean, you must have had everyone wanting to give you a load of gear and you Yeah, know, yeah, I, no, I'll be honest with you. I, like, I, I thought, when I knew that I was kind of becoming well known was when they started booking me for personal appearances at nightclubs. Because mm. um, it was all like millions of people on my phone. So I was getting loads of interaction on my phone. Like I was like, fucking hell, look at all these comments. Look, yeah, look, yeah, look yeah. at all these followers. And then people started recognizing me in the street uh, and I was getting selfies and that. And I was like, this is cool. But then when, when I was, I was doing like for a year, I was doing free personal appearances a week. I'd done mm -hmm. fucking hundreds of them, you know, so all over the country. Is that like up in the unis? And oh, everywhere. Like yeah. That. So, I mean, my management was fucking creaming the money out of it. Do you I know bet, what I mean? Yeah. They, they were fucking, they were just, they just saw me and they was. Did you never know like, how long it's going to last? No, yeah. Like, so they were like, like, get him on the road, go. And this was before I was doing any stand up tours. And I'd go to these nightclubs and, and there'd be fucking 200 kids queued up for pictures. Yeah. yeah and I'd yeah. just be getting fucking hammered. <laughs> yeah, and then. And, you, and obviously your character was. Yeah, fucking. Yeah, so you had to, I guess, play into that. Yeah, yeah, what yeah. What they wanted, right? So. Yeah. And I loved it. I loved it. It, I, it caught up with me after about a year. You know the drink, the constant drinking, the constant like I was pissed constantly. I had to drink. Uh, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know that I had a problem back then. I didn't think I had a problem back then. I, I was just young. I was just drinking, but I'd always drank since I was about fucking fourteen. But I mean, I was drinking hard just to get through. I had to drink to get myself there, and then when I was there, I had to drink to get through the fucking meeting. Everyone, I had to be pissed to be that for last. Yeah. How did you find the uh, the energy uh, of? Because is it hard to be able to? you know, perform for all those people and yeah. entertain the smile and pictures. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, switch it, you. you switch it on. It's difficult because people are looking at you from the moment 
you arrive so yeah. you can feel the eyes they want you to perform yeah well. they're can... going to be disappointed if yeah you're not. I, get, I get it now but i don't get it now since now that i'm sober i don't get the anxiety i used to be riddled with anxiety if i walked in anywhere and i saw people looking at me i i used to i used to think are they looking at me because they like me or are they looking at me because they don't like me? Yeah, yeah. And then I instantly would feel like I have to make everyone like me. So I'd uh. start performing. Uh, it's, it was, a, it, it, it was uh, and the, I thought the alcohol was getting me through it, but the alcohol would just turn me into a fucking knob. But that's uh. what they wanted. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? So, okay. So that put fuel on the fire in a, in a good way yeah. for them, but not necessarily for you. Yeah. So when did it start to, when did that cancel thing come I got in? The I got a TV show. My management at the time were like, look, we've really got to keep the character you know, really push the boundaries on the character. So I got the TV show and uh, slowly I, it, the press turned, really turned against me um, where I was doing more stuff about women, about shagging and TV show was, the TV show was teaching men um, how to seduce women, pull women on a night out. So I was taking like no hopers and rebranding them, giving them a makeover and then right. giving them some chat lines and teaching them how to go. And we had like hidden cameras and they were going up and using jokes to chat up birds. And it was meant to, it was funny. It was meant to be comedy. Personally myself, I'd had no experience in, um, you know, I was a young, I was a young lad and I, I didn't really have any experience in uh, what, what women, go through you know like uh, sexual harassment and all of that stuff it didn't that really wasn't part of my world do you know what i mean i'd lived with my mates since i was 15. and then when you're in that sort of echo chamber and all yeah and it, bantering about I, and you don't no I, d I didn't give a fuck about it to be honest with you i, I was i was young i was I'd like i was a young lad you know i hadn't been educated heavily in all of that stuff and i didn't really see it as a problem and i thought that the world would understand that um that it's it's a comedy, joke, yeah. it's jokes, right? But they didn't. And um, well, just a question on that, because it seems to be some people can get away with it, some people can't. Like, yeah. For example, like Ricky Gervais, I was, you know, you yeah. know, the Golden Globe Awards. Yeah, yeah. Where he just basically started yeah. calling them all pedophiles yeah, yeah. and all that, sort of, <clears throat> and he he says some pretty dark yeah. jokes, and there's quite a lot of comedians that still do. Yeah. So what allows some people to get away from it? Get well, you got like, well, the big one for me that got <clears throat> me in trouble was. And I'll go back to that, but the big one that got me in trouble was um, I, t uh, I was talking about rape, and it was mm. because um, I can't remember who it was, the Huffington Post or or the Guardian or someone had done a big piece on me before I went on stage. I was doing a tour, mm. and before I went on stage, they'd done a piece on me saying that my TV show was an almanac for rape culture, mm. saying that I was teaching men how to rape. And, um, and just quickly, I mean, nowadays that would be an obvious. Oh my God! And the whole world would create a movement against you. But back then, there wasn't really cancel culture, was there? I mean, it was no, there wasn't. And, yeah, it was the you're start. One of the first to get cancelled. I was the. F I feel. I feel like I was the first to get cancelled. But the mob fucking jumped on it. But it really upset me because my my family's been affected by sexual violence. Do you know, we've had right. it in the family, and it's been. Um, you know, so my family. You know, some people in my family were questioning me about it, and you know, I've dealt with. That what that actually is, what mm -hmm. that actually means. What they were saying to me was, you know, I dealt with it. We've dealt with it in our family, and and uh, it hurt me, it upset me, and um, I was angry. And I went on stage and I said some shit that I shouldn't have said. You know, I just basically went on and I said, you know, if I if I wanted to create a TV show teaching men how to rape, I wouldn't have wrote thirty uh, six thirty minute episodes. I just would have done one one minute episode and said, go down the road, get some duct tape, and that's that's the line that I went down. You know, mm -hmm. if I wanted to do it, that's what I would have done. And then a woman at the front said, my friend Lucy's gagging for rape, and I, I repeated it. I said, what's that? She's gagging for rape, and they cut it. So they cut mm -hmm. it and they put it out. So it was me going, do you know what you want to do? You want to go down the road, da -da -da. Oh. and then she's gagging for rape, and they put that out, and that was it. That was the end. And it, uh, and when it happened, I, I saw it, and I was like, surely people ain't going to buy that. That. You know, they were trying to paint me as pro rape. I think they buy anything though. People yeah, people do. They don't even look media. at it. All they look they, like they, you could have the video in a link that you have to go to, but on the top it says pro rape comedian that mm -hmm. So don't even click on the link and they go fucking wanker. You know what I mean? They don't. They, no one's going to go back and watch the whole gig to see the context of it. No one. So um, and then and then the petition started. Sixty thousand people signed a petition, and then it just went like a deck of cards. They cancelled the TV show, cancelled um, cancelled my tour. I've I got sued. Lost hundreds of thousands of pounds on the tour, so everything that money but that. You're, I, but you're grateful you didn't get your social media's deleted though. That that's happened. the only thing that saved me. Yeah, so I, d I lost all my money. I lost lost all my work. I couldn't work. All my job. My management dropped me. You know, because uh, other people apparently other talent on the roster was saying uh, I got sued from different brands when I couldn't complete the obligations and loads of stuff happened. And and around that time, my father, unfortunately, because he was my father was like my voice of reason really my dad every, where, where everyone sort of felt sorry for me and was kind of like or you sh you know whatever um he uh he had a stroke he, his attitude was very much 
well, look what you achieved anyway. Do you mm. know what I mean? Look at what you did. Fuck it. Like, who put you on TV anyway, sort of thing. Mm. Um, so we had a laugh about it. And he, unfortunately, he died of a stroke, which really hit really hit me really, really bad. And that was kind of the point for me where, you know, um, I mean, I look back on it all and I kind of hold my hands up a little bit. I, I've got peace of mind now because I can take accountability for how far I push things. You know, now I've got two daughters, right? So I've got two little girls and I'm like, right, I get it. I get it mm. from some people's perspective. I get it now. Having someone with million followers, like Andrew Tate, having someone with million, millions of followers, joking or not, spurting some of that shit is going to encourage people. So I can, once I'd come to peace with that, that it wasn't all, you know, it wasn't, I didn't do anything wrong. It was yeah. kind of like, mm, you needed, you needed fucking calming down really, yeah, yeah. you know? So once I come to peace with that, um, I thought the extent of it was brutal, but once I come to peace with that, and that wasn't till recently, till I've only, I've only been sober 10 months and I had to go through my sobriety. Congratulations, mate. Thank you very much. I had to go through my sobriety to, to look back and like to peel the layers away and go, fucking hell, you was a twat though. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> and, uh, and come to peace with it. And now I'm like free of it. I'm like, oh yeah, man, it was a massive fuck up. And, and look at what I've overcome, you know, very much like this. But when my father died, it just broke me. You know, it was just like, it was kind of like, so it, I don't know who I was talking to, whether it was the universe or God or what, but I was like, fuck you, whoever you are or whatever it, this is, first of all, you've done that to me and now you've fucking done that to me. And then from that point, I was like, I ain't going to try and be good. I'm not going to try and do good things. And I just went off the rails. And that was where my, my cocaine use and drinking went from like partying and going out to coping. Do you know what I mean? I was like, every I just needed it to fucking to survive and I didn't give a fuck about anyone and I, I really sort of turned on the world for a while so mm. that was like my lowest so you mentioned there about sobriety and it's um I think a lot of people think that when you get clean and sober it's just about not taking drink and not taking drugs right and yeah. I, went, I remember when I went to rehab I did six months in rehab and I wow. turned up and uh that's what I thought they were going to teach me and when and then I realized they weren't even talking about it <clears throat> and really it was about getting to know yourself and yeah. finding out the root cause of why you're yeah. feeling the need to, to, to numb or to, mm. you know, cope. And they broke me down and yeah. they built me back up, you know, or I built myself back up. And it's just interesting how you say you've only just realized these things through yeah. coming sober. So I don't think people really realize that going through the difficult times like getting sober isn't just about okay well now i can't drink no it's actually a whole journey of cliche i don't know self-discovery yeah right so what other things so you realized okay maybe my actions were a little bit out of place what, what other things did you come to realize yeah i think i think just on that what you're saying that is the reason why sobriety is so difficult because you know like i wasn't i wasn't um alcohol or drug dependent so i wasn't like i wasn't what you'd uh, consider your your classic alcoholic or drug abuser where because I could go three or four days without it. I didn't think I had yeah, a problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But when I'd start, I wouldn't fucking stop. And if anything, and I mean anything happened in my life, anything, mm. I'd drink and sniff gear. Well, I would just, I would argue a little bit to that, that that probably is the typical drug abuser. Well, actually. no, actually, no, I love that you say that because stereotypically, people think that it's sat crack on the park bench. Or, or crack addict. Or yeah, crack addict. addict. Yeah, yeah. But actually, and this is where I hit, get a lot of flack with the content and stuff that I do at the moment around it because unfortunately, I talk about being a binge user at the weekends and stuff and people, everyone out there is like, I haven't got a problem. I do that and I haven't got a problem. But then you say to them like, how's, how's things with your family? I've broke up with my missus yeah, yeah. and I can't go to work and da 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 da. Well, yeah. you have got an and issue what, then. what would happen if you didn't do that binge? How would you feel about yourself then? Yeah, exactly. I, I remember hearing something once, someone said that an alcoholic or a drug addict is someone where the drugs or the alcohol cost them more than just the money. Yeah, yeah, I love that. And yeah. that's like, yeah, that's but, powerful. But, but going back to what you said, um, that's why I think that sobriety is so difficult because I've, ne I never, I've never had in the last 20 years or 25 years, I've never had enough time to think properly about what's going on. I'd always, as soon as I'd have to start thinking about it or something would pop into my head, something went wrong or the, a thought would come in that I felt uncomfortable with, I'd drink. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? Or I'd be, I'd be, I'd, I'd just spent the last 20 years either drunk or hung over. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was it. So, um, so you get a week out of the way and then a second week and then all these emotions and feelings and thoughts come back and you can't escape them. The third week, you're fucking dealing with them and it fucking ate me up for months, you know? You're, you feel like an elephant 
not in the room, but an elephant in your own life where you're, mm. you're suddenly fucking discovering that, like who you are. And yeah, yeah. you know, the layers are peeling back. And I used to listen to people talk about this shit, like finding themselves. And I used to think, fuck off. What do you mean finding yourself? I'm going away to find myself. And I really fucking start, I guess it's like spirituality or whatever, but I really started, started like I looked at my house. Do you know what I mean? Like right now I'm trying to sell my house. I'm selling my McLaren. I got a McLaren. Do you know what I mean? And I, it's like I woke up in this fucking two million pound house with a McLaren on the drive, sitting there going, what the fuck am I doing? What, oh, wow. what What? do I need this for? Like my missus is away at the moment. I'm walking around the house and I fucking, ha I, I don't want to sound ungrateful, but I, it, it, it's got a, a massive mortgage on it, which is going up. It's got like a million pound mortgage on it, which is going up. And I'm like, well, I've made it. Why don't I take, get rid of the mortgage and buy something small and don't have to worry about money mm. ever again, you know, or worry about paying something ever again. What have I got a, a car on the drive when I've got two babies? Mm. Do you know, why have I got that car there? That money should be invested in a business or do you know what I mean? You know, it's, this is all this. I, I just felt like, I felt like that was the drunk me trying to show the world that I didn't have a problem. That was a drunk me trying to show everyone that I've got money. Mm. Well, actually, have you got money? Or have you got a load of debt on the house? And, <laughs> uh, and, and have you got, are you wasting 120,000 pounds, which, which could be put towards your daughter's houses in the future or something, yeah, yeah. you know what I mean? And it's like I woke up in, in, I woke up in this life. And, um, but it was beautiful as well. I mean, you know, my, my miss is kind of an air of relief. She's like, oh, great. But, you know, she's, <laughs> she, yeah, she's like, I don't, I, we don't need this house. I, you definitely don't need that McLaren. Do you yeah, know what yeah. I mean? And all of these things. And it's like, she's like, it's like, I'm, she says, it's like, I'm slowly coming back. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And um, dealing with my emotions, working out what I haven't got over in the past. And, and I'm sure you'll agree, just the gratification and pleasure you get from trying to better yourself every day. It's just, mm. a you know, there's so many, this is what we should teach people at school, I think. There's so many, so many of my mates out there, that I, and I talk about this stuff, and my mates are like, what are you going on about? But when you wake up in the morning, you go, right, I'm going to do my fitness, you know, I'm going to plan my day, you know, if, if you meditate or do anything like that. And just, just the pure act of thinking about making yourself better is so rewarding. I've never done that. I, I, I constantly thought my whole life that, Right, I'm gonna work, earn a bit of money, then get fucked, mm -hmm. and that was my that was my reward. I think that's most people's life as well, isn't it? Yeah. Which is a sad thing, you know. I don't think people see an, a, an alternative, yeah. and it's because they don't have the education. You're right, and you're completely right there. Where you say, you know, we should teach kids that, and that's something we're actually doing um, yeah. within our company. Uh, we we first train adults, but we're now incorporating in the. Uh, there's actually probably a bit of a reveal there for anyone listening, but yeah, you know, we're going to be adding uh, new modules and new courses and new content for children and also parents to support their children. Because, yeah, that's brilliant. You know, uh, there was a saying which was, it's better to create well-rounded children than it is trying to fix broken adults. Yeah. You know, and that's what we do. We wait, you know, until we're fucked up yeah. to I'm, go, oh yeah. shit, now it's time to, to to look at the problem. Yeah. Well, how about we don't get to the problem in the first place? Yeah. You know, and it, all it is is a bit of awareness and education around the right things. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully the world will be in a better place and they won't feel the need to go and numb themselves on the weekend and yeah. uh, feel angry and resentful and bitter. And yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a crazy thing, isn't it? I mean, no one told me that drinking was bad. You know, I mean, they told me drugs was bad, but I didn't give a fuck. I wanted to, yeah. I wanted to do whatever my mates were doing to have fun. So, um, and but no one told me that. You know, all right, if you have one or two drinks, that's okay. But if you're, if like my problem was, I loved getting annihilated, right, hammered, and that's kind of what's keeping me sober now because I, I, I you know, I, got, I, I went through this massive period of, oh, the sun's out, man. Oh, I want to be in the beer garden having a beer with my pals. So why can't I be in the beer garden having a beer with my pals? Well, I can. I can with an alcohol-free beer. I can be there for that social environment. And then I realized that ain't even what you want. What you miss is getting fucked up, yeah, right? Yeah. So now that I know, no, you ain't missing nothing, mate. The only thing that you're missing, what you're romanticizing in is, is oblivion. Escapism. Is escaping, it's the oblivion, it's the escapism. And once I mastered that in my mind, I was like, yeah, that, the, that escapism is nothing but destructive for you. So instead of trying to escape your life, let's work on making the life brilliant so you don't want to leave it yeah and um you don't want to lose it as don't well. want to lose it you know yeah. having fucking arguments with my missus every fucking weekend and then thinking to myself oh me and her ain't working out and this is a load of shit because she's watching me get hammered every weekend not yeah. being there for the kid now that i'm a present good father i mean obviously there's loads of stuff that we can do better she's happy mate and it's true happy wife happy life mate yeah. she's happy i was gonna say when you when you turn sober how how 
relieve was she at that point? It's it, it it doesn't feel real, mate, to me now. I feel like something. You know, I've never been happy for this this length of time in my life. Wow. Never. I've never been happy for more than a week at a time or a matter of days. I've always been happy for a bit and then had arguments. And I should imagine it would be different types of happiness, more of a stimulatory yeah. excitement. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My, my, hap my happiness was around drinking and drug use and, and the family and the kids, but those times were limited as well because really there was an under, there was an underlying air of selfishness and disappointment and, you know, I had to drink. And um, now it feels really, I'll be honest with you, it feels strange um, how pleasant it my life is with my family and mm. my wife and she like she's just like fucking you know she's a different person she's wandering around laughing singing whistling having a laugh and she's playful and she's been stressed for years man so and what about like business wise are you more productive and lazy in things start happening even faster than they were yeah. before yeah yeah definitely i mean i've had many many different projects many different businesses that have just kind of you know great ambition massive starts and then have fitted into nothing yeah. because I've just let go of it needs the, that consistency doesn't yeah, it yeah I've let go you know I've wanted the fun. reward straight away and I, I've I've let go of it so I've lost I've lost many businesses brands and stuff like that and um in, instead of like starting something and then you know getting bored because it's not working straight away and then fucking it off and trying to do something else I've like stripped back and focused on my core businesses that are working and then instead of trying to start loads of other things and, and then just really pushing them mm. and and and, it, and it, it's it's great it's less stressful I'm working I'm yeah I'm working better I'm up at 4:30 every morning and I I'm, and then I'm boxing at 5:30 till 6:30 wow. and then I'm working and that's seven days a week I'm managing mm. to, to operate at that now. And you're also saying things like some of the projects, you know, you said, oh, I've been working on this for 10 years. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and now I'm coming back, you know, I've got this project I've working on for five years and now they're starting to go like, yeah. so you yeah. think that's because it was just the time had got to that point or you're able to now push it over the edge and get that completed now as well? Exactly that, exactly that, you know, like, and I wasn't a safe bet, you know, for, for a lot of things are out of my control. So like film, like film, for instance, people need to invest in me, mm. you know, and everyone liked me, but whether I was investable when I was, because I was half investable, half fucking maniac. Half big risk. Yeah. yeah, I was half investable, half maniac. But now when people look at me and I say, this is what I'm going to do, this is what it's going to look like, they believe me. Whereas mm. before people were like, we love you, we want to work with you. Yeah, tell us more when it's ready. Tell yeah, us more. Yeah. You know, like my tour, for instance, there was probably periods, you know, in the last 10 years where I was coming, I was coming back and I was coming up with good comedy and stuff like that. But, but from the sidelines, the industry might have still been looking like, yeah, it's fifty percent good, but fifty percent fucking mayhem. But I like, I, and it's karma. A lot of it's karma, mate. You know, I had to hold my hands up internally, not publicly. I had to hold my hands up internally as a man and um, accept some of the stuff I'd done wrong and put that to, and become happy and not 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 fucking chase. Like I was like, I want to come back. I want this. Not chase. Just work. Mm -hmm. Just work. And then it came to me. You know, it was like, are you ready for a tour? You know. You know, I started doing my sobriety stuff and started working, started becoming more intelligent with my comedy. And then I got approached. Wow, do you think it's time for a comeback? Do you want to do a tour? And I was like, see, this is... And I put it all down to sobriety. The same, yeah. there's, there's some massive film producers and massive directors, and I mean like huge, that have been in touch with me. Because that, that, I've done low budget films, right? And acted in them. So, because I weren't getting cast for nothing. I was going to an audition and they were like, ain't you dapper laughs? Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> like, and I'm like, so, and then... You said no. Yeah, 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 no. Yeah, I was acting <laughs> as him. Um, and then I realised that and no one's going to give me no opportunity. So I've got to produce my own films and then cast myself, which, which I've been doing. Well, that's the better thing to do, anyway, yeah. isn't it? So, um, and, then, and then through that work, weirdly enough, through that work and through my sobriety work, there's two massive names in the industry, and I mean probably two of the biggest names in the UK in the film industry, um, through my sobriety work, through my podcast, have found out about me, then gone and looked at my acting work, and then got in touch yeah. and gone, what have you got going on? So to me, the sobriety um, and the clarity all comes to hand in hand, you know? It's like karma, I guess. Yeah, and like the, the law of the universe. Yeah. There's another thing that i um, got my notes here that you know I wasn't aware that you were doing is um, you've got a... Uh, a Facebook community called Mate, which is men's and their emotions. Yeah. And that's got 41,000 members. Yeah. I've got down here. So it's not just that you're helping yourself, um, but you're also helping other people. And of course, mm. I mean, I believe, you know, that when you put that energy out there and you're helping other people, yeah. it comes back. Whether or not that's a, a law of the universe thing or that's just, you know, 
people knowing that you're doing good things and they want to return that favor and, and karma, yeah. as you said. Um, do you think that's had an impact on on every on your career, on yourself? Yeah, and may, maybe. Helping others? Maybe for me, for me, that that was a conscious effort for me because, I, 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 like, put it this way: the, the press, the, the newspapers, and everything like that. Right, I went through a period of my life where I was like, oh, maybe if I do good stuff, the press will see, and then I'll be vindicated, and 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 I'll be, you know, people will accept me again in the public. They won't see me as like this pro. And then I realised that's never going to happen. Right, the press. The, pre the press and the public and everything like once they've written you off you're written off right and you know I don't want more followers I don't want more fame I don't want more money what I, what I want now is I want what I've got I want to appreciate what I've got and I want to work on what I've got and I love it and at the beginning of my sobriety I said to myself stop thinking about what you, stop doing these things so you can get something out of it right what you've got to do is you've got to look at this like if you want to keep your platform and if you want to if you want to keep receiving all the things you love from your platform you've got to give some of it away mm -hmm. right and my thinking was i want to put as much effort into 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 helping the people that are struggling that are following me into helping myself making money make you know um, and, and progressing right so that's why I, I committed to doing a podcast every week on sobriety which i didn't particularly want to do because it was like publicly really talking deep in depth mm -hmm. about everything I've done wrong. Um, That's part of the healing process. But it is, though, right? you know, it's massively part. You have to fucking, you have to give yourself away, right? Yeah. Um, and and I love how honest you've been today and not skated around things. No, no, man. It's the ego, it isn't it? it? It's the ego. Yeah. It kills us, you know. And I, 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 I love to say to lads, look, look, just admit it, man. You, you, you're doing stuff for the wrong reasons, and you know, da da da, whatever. And, and it, it's like it frees you, doesn't it? It frees you of that ego. And um, the, but the men and the most group came about when I started talking about my sobriety and um, being suicidal and drinking and the drug use and being horrible to my missus on come downs and you know the real gritty stuff lads all reached out to me and it really kind of broke me because the darkness that, uh, that the, a lot of the lads that are following me are going through you know not being able to see their kids you know trying to get sober too late after they've wrecked their families or cheating and um you know spunking all their money and just whatever just ruining their lives and then that that shame and 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 then ultimately wanting to kill themselves and having these messages come through it broke me man and um i i, I just thought I can't help you, man. Like I'm not the guy to help you. I can't talk to you. I'm not qualified. Um, I was too scared to. So I was too scared to give these people advice, especially when some of the families of the people, you know, I've, I had it a couple of weeks ago. You, you know, I still get it now in the group, you know, where wives or whatever say, you know, he really loved your stuff, but we lost him, you know, and it fucking breaks me. So I created the group where I was like, just if you have a problem, you can anonymously put it out there. And then the lads that are in the group, they can chip in with anyone that's got the same experience. And the beautiful thing about the group is, even if you're not going to chip in, even if you're not going to post anything, even if you're just watching, you can see that you ain't alone. You're, well, there's 41,000 other people. There's there. other lads going yeah. through, exactly. And not just that, you can see someone that's saying, uh, I think my wife's cheating on me. She's texting a, a guy from work or whatever. I don't know how to deal with it. What shall I do? You might fucking be going through that and you're seeing you go, oh, fucking hell, click on the comments and then there's all that fucking advice there. And and then you, there's something in there that might go, all right, cool. And it's men helping men, man. And I think that's a massive part of what, what we're losing is you know, because we're so competitive with each other, is men, you know, not, not, you know, I don't want to be like a sissy about it, but men opening up and talking as men and giving men's, men's men advice, you know. We got a lot of advice from women coming to men. Oh, there's loads of advice out there on women, how men, women telling men how they should be and how they should act and how they should deal with things. But with brutal honesty, that's not what we fucking need. We don't need women telling us, I mean, with some things, this is tricky water now, but with some things like how- Yeah, but we might get canceled again. <laughs> yeah, how, how we treat women and how we behave with women, we certainly need educating on. Yeah. But how to be men, we need men. Of course. To deal, to deal with men, you know, it's men need men. Both parts, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And both perspectives. Yeah, and, 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 the beautiful, and the beautiful thing about the group is it's all about accountability. You have men in there saying, well, no, actually, what you're doing is wrong. And you need to see what you're doing is wrong. And maybe you're the cause of this. And maybe, and then uh, and men opening up and saying, look, I fucked this up. I fucked that up. Because our ego is is a killer, man. Mm. 
And I love that name, by the way. I think that's got some serious legs to go further than a Facebook group, like men's and, and their emotions. Mates. Mates, I mean, that's yeah. perfect. Yeah. I mean, that's really, like, clever brand. Um, so well done. I'm all about the Did brand. Did you come up yeah. with that? Yeah, I did. Well no, actually, I didn't. I asked my Facebook to come up with it. So I, with everything I do... That's if even I, more clever, really. Yeah, if I, everything I do, people, and yeah. my podcast, I say, what do you want it to be called, you know? So looking at some more notes here... Um, you've touched on um, the podcast that you started up specifically for sobriety so yeah. that's amazing and that's been getting some really great uh, response as well yeah, yeah, by yeah. looks of it you know loads of views um, and some of the stuff you can well I mean I could t I could talk about it but tell me some of the stuff you're up to now uh, in terms of um, some of the next pieces that are coming up uh, it's all about stand-up comedy at the moment you know I'm, I'm in this weird place at the moment where I'm allowed to go and perform in comedy clubs again yeah. You know, it's it's sort of happening and it's it's a How did it feel to get back up on the stage? Yeah, it's great, but it's scary because bet, yeah. because I'm used to I'm used to cuz I've got my own nightclub in Clapham. I normally put okay. in, put on my shows there and invite my fans. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so they can say what you want, I guess. So they come down and I'm just <laughs> like, "Wait." And they're like, "Oh my god, he's here." And I'm like, "I can say I can stand there and say anything." But the comedy clubs are people that majority of them don't know me. They haven't heard of me, you know. Well, really? some well some just... some people do some but I always say, "Anyone know who I am?" And a lot of the time they don't, you know, because yeah. they you know, you think. I guess maybe if they're younger. Yeah, yeah, younger, younger as well, or older. You get a lot of yeah. older people. Yeah. So, um, and then you really, you really have to do intelligent stand-up comedy. You know, you can't get, you can't get away with. You have to write brilliant jokes and and talk about current current mm. stuff. You know. And it's a fear also around like, am I going to say something that I shouldn't say? Is uh, that yeah. In the back yeah. of your mind. Yeah, yeah. I'm, the, the only thing I'm worried about is, you know. Uh, saying something but I'm, I, I'm, there's so many cameras on you that yeah it's only one slip up and yeah i'm I'm, I'm i'm i've kind of i know where the line is man i'm kind of intelligent enough but you never know my, my mind my 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 mouth works quicker than my mind sometimes. and also the other thing is you, you kind of don't know until you can look back on it because yeah. the 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 movement around this yeah. these things change daily and you don't yeah. know what's going to be offensive but also people are fucking pissed off with cancel culture of course, you know it's yeah. detrimental to 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 everything i mean if you if you have a look at you know not not being able to say how you actually feel can result in terrible things happening on like a political level mm. do you know what i mean or so even losing your identity or not being able to express yourself yeah, fully as a person, yeah, yeah. even things on that so being, being out being out um i feel like i'm starting all over again it's great fun Cool. So let's see what other bits and pieces. So you also diagnosed with ADHD. Is that it was a more recent thing that you yeah. found out about, or? Yeah, that that was um, uh, that was because I thought I was bipolar. Okay. Yeah, and I thought. Um, was that because of the the come downs? <laughs> mate, exactly that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. Cause... I actually, do you know what? I was actually also di I was diagnosed with bipolar, and it really? was because of the come downs. Really? Yeah, because obviously my manic behaviour. It's like fuck, one minute he's a fucking lunatic, the next minute he's like, in, you yeah. know, in bed for fucking days and depressed. I mean, obvious to us. Yeah. It's like, well, he's, he's fucking getting on the gear. But yeah. I, I guess to a psychiatrist, they look at the symptoms on paper, and they're just like, well, actually, this does tick the boxes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I didn't have it. Well, yeah. What was happening? what was happening to me was exactly that what was happening to me was i was having these i know it's like delirium it's like delirium it's like a it's a form of psychosis and i've learned quite a lot about mixing uh cocaine and alcohol it creates like another i don't know if it's called co coethylene or co, co i don't know you'd have to yeah i've actually yeah yeah I've it creates it. another drug in your body and and uh they think it's a huge link to suicide in in young men because the come downs um the come some people are susceptible to that have never ever considered suicide that that, that weren't planning suicide or anything like that uh, and i've got a woman coming on the podcast actually that i've been talking to her it happened to her son and she's created this thing where, they, where they're researching it a lot where it's like her son's just like couldn't handle to come down and just topped himself and another guy was on a session all night and he had to go back to take a delivery of a fridge and an hour before the fridge was delivered he'd he'd like committed suicide yeah. in a brutal way and it's like something clicks in the yeah. head on this on this I, I've, I've had a few friends that have done it and i've actually thought myself loads of times because it's just it's the dopamine response you know i don't yeah. know if you if you in the brain the, the but when you're on coke or alcohol mix yeah the receptors are basically firing overdrive and you're basically just rinsing all your dopamine to the yeah. point where there's nothing left. Yeah. What happens is that dopamine, once you stop taking the drugs, stops. And also, when you continuously take cocaine, it scars off the receptors to the point where it can't even hit anymore. So even when you're recovered after your come down, it's like your brain's not used to, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's just like, where's my coke? You know, so it's not, 
giving you that dopamine yeah. anymore. So you're just going to be depressed. Yeah, but I, they think that there's something else. Like it's like a delirium. It's like a, a psychosis. So you know when you see stuff in a co induced psychosis, it's like something switches. You lose control, and it's like your brain kills you. Right. It, your brain makes you kill yourself. You know. So it's not just a. Depression. It's not a planned it's suicide. Like yeah, it's impulse. not like a, like an impulse, like an impulse. And I found it really interesting because, um, and and I think there needs to be so much more awareness around it because I was taking coke and drinking and then just thinking, oh, maybe one come down could be too much. Do you know what I mean? And um, you can't really. I mean, it's and they go hand in hand, don't they? Yeah. If you get too pissed, you got to take coke. And if you take too much coke, you got to drink more drinks. So yeah. it just goes. Yeah, but you don't, you don't, you don't, you know, if, if, you know, like when Leah Betts, God rest her soul, died from taking a pill from an ecstasy pill right. uh, in Essex. She t it was famous. It was all on the news. And I can remember when that happened, I looked at pills in a different way. I was like, oh, mate, if I could die from taking a pill, I don't think I'm going to go for the pills. I'll stick with the coke. Yeah. Right. Um, but if there's same awareness or was around that and it was like, you know what, lads are um, dying by suicide from um, without being able to control it because something's happening in their brain because of this mixture of da, da, da. and if it was a massive campaign then lads that were experienced really bad come downs might go fucking hell this could be this could mm. be the last come down but what was happening to me is and uh, I've spoken to a psychologist about it since uh, was a similar thing um, where I was having this delirium the next day after a come down where I'd have to like fucking uh, like something something was wrong but I didn't know what it was mm -hmm. and I'd go into this weird state where I was like round with my missus trying to find out what was wrong something was wrong yeah, da, yeah. Da, 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 you know fucking going mad and then storming out of the house and walking and finding myself in places I didn't know where I was it was fucking mad like this was really happening to me and then I went to the psychologist and I started seeing the shrink and I was I was doing counselling uh, the first time I went sober I was doing counselling and I was telling her about it and she was like you know you're not bipolar it's, that's not what it is it's the drugs uh, it's the company downs and, da, 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 all, and all of this stuff but through that we explored ADHD because of a lot of the other stuff I was doing because ADHD people have naturally low dopamine and prone to addiction a bit more 80% of people with ADHD have some form uh, prone to addiction some form of addiction and uh and then the stuff where she was like asking me about my thoughts and you know all the all the different projects that I had going on and everything, how I manage my thoughts, what it's like for me in the mornings, in the evenings, and all of this stuff. And then I realised that the way that my mind works and what I think, it's not the normal way. You know, people don't have to battle to normal people don't have to battle mm -hmm. to concentrate on one train of thought. And I guess the problem is if you, if no if no men are talking with each other, then you don't know your thoughts are different. Yeah, right? exactly that. Yeah, I had no idea. I thought everyone was just going through the day struggling to <laughs> like when I get up in the morning I, I, when I'm doing and it happens constantly like I'm not just saying like every now and then like I, like even here when I went to get coffee I went to get coffee I ordered coffee and then I, I walked off and I started like looking at something else then I came back and then I forgot I'd ordered the coffee so then I come to come in through the door and the guy was like you've got to pay for your coffee so I went back and I paid for the coffee and then I walked off and he said the coffee so I went back and got the coffee and it's like because I'm halfway you're in your head yeah well, I'm halfway through while I'm ordering the coffee I'm thinking oh I wonder I wonder what uh, number the room is yeah, uh, yeah but but the ADHD gives you the impulse the, the impulse is too hard to to focus so like I'll be washing something up at home and I'll be like what are you drying it up yeah yeah I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or I'll be washing something up and I'll be like oh, I wonder what's on TV tonight and I'll be halfway through the tap will still be running and I'll go in and onto the right. it's fucking mental right but I don't want to take the Ritalin or the, uh, the, the drugs for it because I believe that it's the, the the root of my comedy creativity, but the um, but the but the cocaine is same as Ritalin. It's a stimulant. Mm. So the cocaine, when I used to take the fucking drugs, it was like bliss for me. Mm. It was calm. Like most people take coke and and they're like fucking all over the place. I mean, I still chatted a lot of shit, <laughs> but like I am now. But I mean, <laughs> when I took the cocaine, the noise in my mind, it was like the alcohol and the drugs. It w it was a form of self medication, mate. Hundred percent, I and loved you can it. Communicate. You said you shout shit, but actually, that communication, I think, is why a lot of people do it. Yeah, yeah. You can sit down there and have a yeah, heart but heart focus on one thing. Yeah, yeah. One thing for fucking hours to me, which was fucking brilliant to me. It's mad because you actually can have some of. The, well, I, I for sure before I obviously got into recovery, the deepest and most heartfelt conversations I'd ever had in my life yeah. were, were on a on some coat, yeah. you know, in a random fucking kitchen somewhere with a bloke I've never met. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. uh, it, it lame Coming up with business ideas. <laughs> yeah, that tomorrow I'll meet you at Muay Thai at 6 a.m., right? Yeah, You're yeah. definitely going to be there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> all sorts of crazy shit. The next day, delete. Fucking hell, who the fuck's that crazy? <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, but, <laughs> but um, yeah, no, but you do, don't you? Because you do have an opportunity to kind of like... Yeah express and offload and yeah yeah and i think that's part of why people do it as well yeah and, and and that's that that's that's why for years and years and years i never wanted to go sober i, I, I didn't i didn't want to lose that and i've lost probably my closest friend 
now. You know, he was the best man. At, he was the best man at my wedding just a year ago. He was the best man at my wedding, which I was completely fucked at, by the way, which is one of the biggest regrets of my life. Because uh, I went sober and then I thought I could come back to it and just drink, but I couldn't. We've all been there. Yeah. And um, uh, a little message to anyone out there, actually. I'd love to share that. Yeah. If you're into sobriety, it's inevitable. There is always going to come a point where your brain is going to trick you. Because they say that addiction is cunning and baffling, right? Mm. And it is. It can trick you. Like, it's stronger than sometimes your own will, which is why yeah. we get ourselves into that shit in the first place. Yeah. It, no, no normal person would be like, oh, I'm fucking my life up. Let's carry on doing it, you yeah. know? But it can trick you into thinking that it's a good idea. And when you're in sobriety, when you're in that early recovery phase, uh, you know, you've got a lot of positive information in there. You're quite close to the, the journey that you've been on, so you know that it's a good idea. But as time passes, though, you know, the back of your head can start saying, well, actually you weren't that bad maybe, exactly maybe you could have a couple beers now yeah. and just be careful with it and you know have control yeah, that's exactly what happened and then you do it and then yeah. that becomes two four and then i'll tell you what i'll have one line and then yeah. you know you're back you know even maybe worse because you've got a load of guilt that comes with it yeah. now as well so for anybody who's in recovery just a quick message yeah when you get that voice don't listen to it because it's it's a fucking lie mm. all right it's bullshit and it's not worth going through that mess again yeah i think a lot of people uh, kind of, yeah. Think that once once they recovered, they recovered. Oh, I don't, I don't, yeah. it's, I don't, it's gone. I'm not. I'm not an addict anymore. I'm not an alcoholic anymore, or whatever. Yeah. I mean, do you identify with that being gone from your life, or do you still identify as it? It's always going to be a part of me. I think that. Um, I think that I was in active addiction, mm -hmm. uh, but I'll always be an addict. Yeah. That's I'll always be an addict. I mean, you have to admit that. Like, I, I, like I'm an I'm, I'm an addict still now. I'm an yeah. addict to boxing. <laughs> Me too. I'm an addict to yeah. coffee and work. And hobnobs. And I fucking I go <laughs> through a pack of hobnobs a week. I've got them. I've got them in my. That's my dopamine. Yeah, that's my yeah. dopamine. I've got a pack of hobnobs uh, next to my bed in the drawer, and every night I open it, I have two hobnobs. My missus fucking she gives me looks at it. I'm like, it's better a bag of hobnobs than a bag of fucking gear. Yeah. So shut your mouth. Like, and I and I and I work I work in my ass off in the gym in the morning. I do an hour like, yeah. and I spa three times a week. So I'm like a couple of fucking chocolate biscuits. Yeah. Yeah. And the Can coffee. I live, please? Yeah, yeah I'm, a, I'm an addict. I'm an addict. And um, I'm not, you know, I'm not, a, I don't know how you become an addict, whether it's like um, genetics in your or if it's just because you've got low dopamine, you're susceptible to it, or if it's from abusing drink and drugs, or maybe, and this is something that I thought, you know, I was okay with drink or drugs till something traumatic happened in my life, and then I turned to it and couldn't turn back. I don't know, but I'm not ashamed to say I'm an addict anymore. In fact, I'm very much, same as getting cancelled. It gives me purpose to talk about now. And also, I mean, being an addict can be really, really good skill because yeah. it means you become with obsessed with things. With business. Yeah, yeah, like you can't, I can't pull myself away from a laptop. You know, sometimes I can be working 14 hours in a day, you know, yeah. seven days in a week and I've got to literally be dragged away from it, yeah. which is not ideal. And there's repercussions to that as well that I need to look at. But at the same time, it may help you make a big impact to make yeah. a lot of money and you can become yeah. obsessed with the gym or, yeah. you know, so. But it, I think on, on what you were saying on the real, on like a relapse or that happened, I think you need that though. I think, I think you need, I needed that because. I, I do hear a lot of people seeing that and, and it, yeah. I think it's, it's only because it confirms, okay, I can't actually ever do Yeah, that. exactly. And also. But I'd be better if people would, understand yeah, that before yeah, doing of course, it to be of fair because we don't want people listening going oh, oh yeah, okay, i need yeah. a read no, yeah, you're, out. Yeah. i'm gonna yeah, do that i said tonight. i need that i'm gonna do that now let's get out of the way and done with yeah my boys <laughs> yeah all right well maybe the better the better way to put it is i needed that you but needed to understand yeah that. definitely i needed to i needed to double check that i i <laughs> I, I, I i completely couldn't but then, you, but then you might need to triple check it later no no right? no because no. now it's been like five years now it's oh, yeah. older now you know? but for me for me the, the 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 key to sobriety for me the key to sobriety is not looking at looking at it like you're missing out saying it's looking like you're free of it and this is why it's so infectious to talk mm. about sobriety to, to to like you become one of these sober gurus and all of this shit mm. and stuff like that and i don't give a fuck because people take the piss out of me a lot but i'm i kind of feel like saying to them but if you knew what i knew now do you know what i mean if you knew once you get past those big turning points of sobriety i, I like i know i'm only fucking 10 months into it this time but like a month two months six months and like now i, I mean don't get me wrong i'm still heavily triggered by things you know even coming into london towards the end of the week mm -hmm. i used to get off me nut um if the sun's out or if yeah. i have an argument with someone if sanctions like a wedding like yeah wedding. Wedding i mean like i can't go certain things with certain people there's certain people that i just i can't be with anymore i'll just you know uh, and i'm still triggered but the difference is now 
I'm a firm, firm fucking hardcore believer on mindset. It's like one of the most, one of the, one of the, one of the most powerful things with everything I do is how to control my mindset. And I believe there's massive power in controlling your thought process and how you think mm. and understanding your mind, right? So when my mind tells me to do something, I can hear it as a, as a trigger, not as my voice. Yeah. So like when, so I had a big one, big turning point for me was probably about, I was probably about four months in, four or five months in, and I was gonna go on the smash. Cause my missus, it's the first time my missus and kids had gone away. She was like, you know, you'll be fine. It was like, there wasn't even a thought of me being on my own. And whenever she'd go away, I'd fucking go for it. She went away, it was the sun, the sun was out. All my mates were on Instagram and everything. Everyone I knew was out drinking and stuff like that. It was a Friday and I was sat in my office. I had no work over the weekend, no kids, nothing. And, and it must be e like even more difficult when you've got some money and yeah. you've got some fame. Yeah, yeah. You've got people that want you to play yeah. that character. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're, they're all, people were still like... People were still checking if I'm definitely sober. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And I sat there on that fucking, uh, on my, at my desk in my office and I sat there and I thought no one will fucking no and there's a couple of lads i know that won't say nothing mm -hmm. you know and i'm just gonna and then i fucking my thought when yeah it started off oh, i can't believe i'm not at the pub they're all having fun in the pub and it went straight to i'm just gonna get graham in here actually on my own on some beers and then i went fucking hell and then i went whoa 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 and yeah. i was like and it was the first time i ever saw my thoughts going through my mind as something else not me yeah, and yeah. I went, I went, fucking, that ain't even you, bruv. Who's, that's a trigger. <laughs> These are all triggers. And I this was like, stupid. yeah, that, I, I was like, well, why are you listening to that? And then I realized what the real work was in sobriety and what the real work was in my life was going and doing things like when I do the sparring or the ice baths or, or if I sit down and fucking write something for long or if I read, doing something that I don't want to do right and and putting myself into it builds that mental resilience and that mental resilience then comes into play when those triggers kick off yeah. i go shut up that ain't even me that's not me that's someone else and i go i'm not listening to you why would i listen to you look what you've done to me before and just as quick as i got into that i got out of it and uh, i had to go and do a run or something but I, I had i had my relief and it was a massive turning point yeah mate i've had the exact same thing and that's such a powerful message um it, i'll tell you what happened with me i was inside rehab and I was like, what the fuck am I here for? This is stupid. Like, I need to get out of here. Like, this isn't for me. And all these thoughts are crazy. They're going through my mind. And then for some reason, I, I caught, again, I, I caught that thought exactly like that. Because I think the problem is we just, we all have this mixture of all these voices in our head, right, that are spiraling. And most people just take that as one undeniable truth that that's them and they listen to whatever voice goes through their head because if you can't trust yourself who can you trust but that's bullshit right yeah, don't you. want to trust yourself yeah Fuck it out. if i trusted myself i'd be in back in jail i can tell you that yeah i've got to sometimes listen to other people and you know what you know yeah, make, yeah. what makes sense rather than what i'm what i'm thinking and we're not our thoughts and i was in rehab and i was thinking i'm gonna leave this is stupid and then i caught the thought and i was like no hang on a minute because no, i've made progress and this is good and and i kind of realized that and I not just didn't listen to the negative part, but I started to try and hone into what the good part was as well. Yeah. And then I've since learned that there's like the inner coach and the inner critic. Yeah. There are these two voices, one that wants to sabotage and one that wants to like lift you up. Yeah. And it's learning to distinguish the differences yeah. between Seen those it. voices. Yeah. And once you can, you can actually go, oh, shut up to that one and I'll mm. channel into this one. Mm. And the beauty of being able to win those arguments, because mm. what I did is I actually wrote myself a note. I said, Lewis, you've been here before. You're going to be here again. Keep going. Love the real Lewis. I like, put it up on my wall. I love that. Out. I love that. Because then when that yeah. spiral goes in, sometimes you can't hear yeah. it because you and you're, you're compelled yeah. by it. But you need and you need a bit of a and, I, I, and and this is why I think it's so hard. So bright, so hard because I have my kit. You know, I got I couldn't go home. I got thrown out and it was over. My missus didn't want to be with me. I couldn't go and see my kids and everything and like so I had reality check. And then when I um, when I went rehab and when I got sober and I come back, I was allowed back. So I had my wife and kids there. Like I had it in front of me. I was like, it's either drink or drugs or these, right? But a lot of people don't have that. It's just themselves. You know, they're on their own. They might not have no money or nothing. And so I know it's harder for some people, but also those voices, when, when you have all of that, everything is pulling you in the opposite direction. People think that that's what sobriety is. That's what they're going to deal with every day. Their mm. life. That's what it is. But it ain't. No. And and that goes away. And yeah. if you fight it and work on it, it goes away. And yeah. and, and 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 that's that, that. This is that's what I mean when I say if I could share with you what what I've learned. And that's waking up and all the voices in my head, a majority positive. Yeah. And and I'll tell you where the, where the learning really came from. That from was getting jealous from with my missus. 
It's, no. uh, because my missus was a glamour model, right? So she's a topless model. She's done page three and Zoo magazine and all of that stuff. And I was completely all right with it back in the day, you know. But then when I was using and da da da, da and you get the paranoia, I'd ask all these fucking questions and I'd say, like, who's contacting you? And I'd start turning into this, like, fucking, this weird, um, you know, when I was off me nut, you know what you get like when you're off your nut, right? And she's like, she was sick of it. She's like, why are you fucking even asking me about stuff like that? Like, that's not you. You do it every time you're on a come down or whatever. And um, when I went sober, those when those thoughts would come into my mind, I used to laugh at them. Yeah, I used, yeah, yeah. I, those thoughts would come in, and I, I used to like, you know, she'd if she was like on her phone or something like that, laughing and joking. I actually used to think to myself, God, there was a time when I'd. I wonder who she's texting. I can't believe that. Yeah. You know, and 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 then I'd I I'd have these insecure thoughts sort of come into my mind and that's where the work started. Yeah. Like any negative thought pattern that come in I'd I'd focus on it as that and and get rid of it. And um yeah. So I think we're almost that, out of time. Is that a, is that end or we've got a couple yeah. of minutes? All right, can we have 1 minute to wrap it? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting, isn't it? Yeah, so I'll just quickly wrap it up then. Yeah, and I completely agree. Like, you can turn, you can decide who you give your your power to, and if you give your power to that inner coach, then that is who you're elevating. And then the inner critic, you know, the negative thoughts, they start to, to fade away. Yeah, and to the point where you only have the positive thoughts, and it, you know, you'll get that little niggly. Yeah, you know, niggle, yeah, yeah. That's what it's, it's like. It's a niggle. It's a niggle, and I, I see an insecurity. Oh, I can't do this, or you, you won't achieve that, or don't bother doing that, or they, or they think this, and they think that. It's weird how much self fucking hate and mm -hmm. shit we give ourselves, isn't yeah. it? We're constantly putting ourselves down and I read, but you're right. And that's what I think sobriety is about. It's awareness. Awareness and loving yourself, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I'm very uh, proud of you, mate, for being able to get sober. I appreciate that. And especially as it must have been really difficult with the extra fame and people probably saying, bring the old dab of laughs back. I still get it oh, now, mate, yeah. That must be fucking, I mean, it's difficult with a group of friends, let yeah. alone fucking millions of people. Yeah, saying, you're Where's not, the old dapper? Yeah, you're not funny no more. Mate, you might. Yeah, I, but I, I'm at peace at that as well. I'm nearly 40. Like, I'm 39. So I'm like, if I ain't funny no more and, and this is what I'm doing with the rest of my life, then fuck it. Mate, you know I, what I mean? I prefer Daniel O'Reilly I've met today. Oh, I really <laughs> appreciate that. Thank you. And uh, you've definitely turned your adversity into an asset and I'm looking forward to what's to come. You've got a whole career ahead of you. Yeah, thank so thanks you. for joining me. And, it's uh, been a pleasure. That was a great chat. Thank you. Cheers, mate.